way. Thank you. She's really nice. She talks to me all the time. Okay, can you see that good? All right. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sign in and take one of those booklets to, I'll talk about in just in a second. So, so glad you could. Okay. Um, I do feel bad because I, I got, th these were delayed in, um, because of the, whatever it's called, shipping. What is it? What, what do you call it? The supply chain. The supply, the supply chain problem caused us to get these late. Normally we get them a week or so before. So I got them last, like Monday morning and I had them and I was all ready to give them. It's just a devotional for, for Advent. One page a day, you just read a little bit. It's written by different people. It's a really wonderful little way to meditate each day. And it is a gift of one of our parishioners, the church secretary, Mary Butler. Um, she and her husband were both in the Navy and um, I think they both retired. But anyway, they're just a very, very wonderful couple. And for years, she's given me enough to cover the Bible study and the RCIA. So there's one for everybody. I hope you all can use that. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank everyone so far. People are getting much, much better about letting me know when you won't be here. And that helps me. Not that I'm worried about a number of classes or I'm not keeping records because if you miss so many, it's just that I, I need the records so that if for some reason you choose not to come in right now and want to come in two years from now, I'll have a record that said, yes, you've obviously been through the whole course mess with me. So that's the reason that I do it. Um, but I'm grateful for people calling me. I got an email, uh, another, one of our couples, she got called into work tonight so they couldn't come. And that helps me. Otherwise, I'd kind of wait. I should wait for Logan. I'm pretty sure he'll come. I don't know where he is, but he didn't send me. Um, but anyway, thank you for that. Uh, second of all, I just did get this. If you didn't get one, you can pick it up in the bulletin. was in the bulletin. It should have been in. But uh, just to let you know what's going on, we talked about this very briefly when we were looking at the overview of um, Jesus. And we talked about the dogmas or the teachings on the Blessed Mother. And one of them is that this Wednesday, always on the December 8th, is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mary was conceived without sin, not Jesus. Obviously, Jesus never had sin, but we had talked about it briefly. The, the understanding of the, the theologians is that if Mary was this divine vessel that Christ was going to be using to become a human person, her genetic code is half of Jesus' genetic code. The other half is the Holy Spirit. We have no idea what, what that would be like, but Hers was the human side of Jesus came from the Blessed Mother. So if, he, if, if God was choosing her as the vehicle and her womb as the source through which the word would become a human person, it was believed that that body would never have been contaminated with the original sin and therefore no sin. Uh, she was prepared for this. She was open to it. She had a choice to reject it if she weren't didn't want to, but she did accept it in her fiat. And so the church is taught from the earliest times that Mary was conceived in the womb of her mother and her mother and father's named not in scriptures. <clears throat> it's, um, it's, it's from other writings. There were, there were writings that existed in the very beginning that were attributed to other sources than those selected by the Holy Spirit through the church to determine which books were, as we say, canonical. I did. And um, they, they ha had um, decided that in these early writings, I think it's called the 
it's not called the gospel, is it? Not the gospel. Anyways, it's a story of James um, that, that a woman named Anne and an, a man named uh, Joachim were the mother and father of the Blessed Mother. And there's a story of her youth and all that sort of thing. But it's not canonical. It's, it wasn't declared a book that would make the Bible. It, it wasn't, it didn't meet the criteria for what the Holy Spirit ultimately determined uh, were the books of the New Testament, 27 books. So it's not, <clears throat> it's not a required that we believe the story. It's not required that we accept anything in it, but it's quite often accepted by a, a lot of people in, in the church, in the hierarchy of the church, bishops, cardinals, uh, that these stories are true. So we get the idea of the immaculate conception of the Blessed Mother, and that's what we celebrate. The masses are uh, for the vigil. Remember, the church sort of adopted in a way the, the Jewish tradition. The Jewish Sabbath is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. So we have before Sunday, which is our day of worship, kind of like sundown is the vigil. So the vigil is the night before or the vigil of the morning of the Sabbath. So when there's a holy day like this, like any Sunday, the evening mass for that day before counts as one of the places you can go in order to, to have met your obligation to go to mass. So you can go tomorrow night at 7, at 7 p.m. or the normal morning mass, 6.30 and 8.30. And then there's a noon mass and a 7 p.m. mass on Wednesday. So usually when there's a holy day that uh, the added masses are provided. So that way you'll have an opportunity to, to go. It's one of the four or five days, I think there's five days now that are holy days of obligation that we're expected, we're requested to go to mass. Um, I wanted to ask you all for a favor, prayers more than anything else. I don't think I have to told this class, but one of the things you can pray for, or if you have any ideas that would help Beverly and me a great deal. Our youngest son um, graduated college a long, long time ago, had an entry level job, and then finally got to be a director of religious education for four years at another parish. He was the director of religious education, his own secretary, and the youth minister. He served under four different pastors. I'm not complaining, but they just burned him out. He was the only single man on the parish staff, so anything that needed to be done on weekends, then James could do it. He doesn't have a family. So they just really burned him out. And he started to try to find a different career path. He was going to school, getting his master's degree in theology at the same time he did that for those years. So he got half of a master's degree in theology. But anyway, to make a long story short, he went and decided he wanted to be a counselor, and he got a signed up at um, Marymount in counseling. And he did two courses and made straight A's in both. And they decided that he hadn't had enough background to qualify to enter their program. And they wanted him to take some more courses. So he decided he couldn't do that. So anyway, he got a job through a friend. He's actually was a, he's one of our students in CCD. And he went off, got a degree in accounting and was working at this big school in DC called Moray, which was, um, big private school, lots of money, big people went there. Very much like the Obamas when they wanted to, they looked at Moray when they decided to go to Sidwell. But it's that kind of place. And this guy was the comptroller and he, he ended up having an argument with his accounts receivable clerk. And so he called up and he said, I'll, I'll train James. So they hired James as an accounts receivable clerk at Moray where he processed $28 million a year income and he never took a class in accounting and he mastered it and he stayed there for eight years no one ever questioned his credentials well then this guy moved over got it moved from moray and moved over to alexandria county day school in alexandria virginia and it's a lot easier to get there than to go to moray so he asked him to come over and be the accounts everything so then james went over and learned account receivable accounts payable payroll everything 
He did that for four years, five. And then some really bright, young, aggressive salesman came and talked the head into disbanding the business office and they could save so much money on those two salaries and they could do all this accounting for them much cheaper. So that 14th of February in the year of COVID, he was let go, not fired, let go. He has been looking for a job since February, 2020. Applies for everything, but he also has a, a mild disability from birth that we didn't know about till he was 28 years old. That makes things a little more difficult for him, mainly cognitive things like geometry and those kinds of things. He can't, doesn't understand the same way you would something simple. So he's always embarrassed that he would embarrass himself if somebody didn't know that. So he's got a difficulty in selling himself like I could sell myself and it's made it harder. But all I'm saying is pray that something, someone, I just don't think it's ever gonna come from the computer. First of all, the computer, if you don't have the right words in your resume, throw you out. And then once you get in it, you're either too qualified or not qualified enough. And um, it's been hard, but he's working faithfully every single day. And I'm confident someone will come along. But just like this, he had no experience in accounting and he did it for 12 years. So I know he can do anything <laughs> that he's asked to do. He did, he did. Oh no, he does. He offsets the disability with unbelievable ability. And he would have worked there. He would have worked there forever. I mean, it's the kind of guy that you give him a job, he's going to stay there until you outsource his job. I mean, he was very, very, and he's an amazing worker. He's just very, very good. So anyway, I just ask you to pray for that and thank you. And if anybody knows, he's good in accounting. He's good in any kind of administrative position. Can do anything, I think, in an office. All right. Um, we're now going to stop for one minute and see if anyone has any questions about the Nicene Creed. We've only spent like nine weeks. Any comments, questions, anything we want to shed light on? Because remember, you see this, this is a summary. This is a summary of the faith. And now we're going to look at how we apply it. Anything you want to go back on? No. Let me ask, um, tonight uh, is the next to the last class. We'll meet next Monday, and then we'll be off two weeks. So next Monday will be the last time we'll meet before Christmas, New Year break. So then we'll come back after that. Okay, um, before I go into this, I wanna ask, and then it'll, it'll make sense in just a second. Um, have I told you, I have a tendency to tell the same story over and over again. My family holds up the number of fingers that they've heard us. So I have a tendency to do that. My dad had the same weakness. So I don't remember class after class after class whether I told you the stories or not. Two stories I'd like to relate, if I've already told you, I'll just highlight them. And if I haven't, I'll tell you. Did I tell you the story of when I was first smoked cigarettes as a, as a six-year-old? No, I didn't tell that story. Well, oh, great. Can't wait to tell the story. What about, did I tell you the story about my grandfather, um, who was a Methodist minister who preached against smoking? No, okay. All right. This is great. And this will, this will make sense. All right. So here's where we are. We're going to begin a four-week study of the commandments. Now, this is why this is why I think it's really cool. Once again, in, in Catholicism, because it's been around for 2,000 years, people have really done a lot of thought and done a lot of research and come up with a lot of information that helps you live your life. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, when I grew up, I do not. I remember going to church and I remember sermons. I remember I went to church for sermons. I remember many, many services from both a Methodist pastor and a Baptist pastor, particularly when I went to Wake Forest. And I've been to Billy Graham Crusades and I've done all of those wonderful things and they're wonderful. But the main structure of forming kind of your conscience seem to either come from practical experience and intuitively knowing something, or maybe something your parents taught you, or maybe something you heard in a sermon. Now, I don't know where I got the absolute horror of smoking, but it was very early. And fortunately for me, 
when I moved, we, we lived in a little apartment in Arna Valley, which is now right off Shirley Highway. They built all those beautiful townhouses over there near the orthopedic hospital. That's where it was. About 1945, I think, my parents bought a house in Country Club Hills near the Washington Golf Country Club off of Glebe Road. And my neighbors living behind were two boys. One was older, one year older, and the other was two years younger than me. The next door was two boys. And the older boy decided that he and his brother and I were going to steal a carton of Chesterfield cigarettes when his parents were out of the house and we were going to smoke. So I was a slave of this guy. And so I went along and I will never, I will truly never forget um, that we would, we, we would take the cigarette out of the pack and, and light it. And I got, I, I don't think we smoked more than three puffs. I got sick as a dog. I thought I was going to die. I hated it, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was I had done it. And he threatened to tell my father that I smoked a cigarette at age six or seven. And that would have meant death. I mean, that was the most horrific thing you could do as a seven year old. So I was this guy's slave for the entire summer. Whatever he wanted done, I did it because he was gonna call and tell my parents. Finally, one Sunday, the phone rang and it was, I have no idea, but it wasn't Bill DeButts, but I knew that it was. Bill DeButts, DeButts. So Bill, not Butts, DeButts, yeah. Bill DeButts, and he, it wasn't him, but I was convinced that it was. So I, in absolute horror and panic, went to confess to my father. And I did. And I can tell you now, looking back, I know he did everything in his power to keep from bursting out laughing. <laughs> I know he was just, but anyway, he calmed me down, assured me that it was all right. The reason that was a good thing is that I never smoked again. And if you smoke, it stunts your growth. Just think of how little I would have been if I had smoked. <laughs> but, the, but the whole point was that that was, a, that was the conscious fear all of my summer. This guy had this power over me because I had done something that evil. So that's the first story about smoking. The second was my grandfather was a very, very wonderful man. He did preach often against cigarettes and so did many Baptists, but the big thing was alcohol because the Baptists and the Methodists never got out of the temperance movement. The 20s, the whole country abstained from alcohol, but those became, made it a matter of faith. And so um, the Methodists and the Baptists would, would not drink. And so my grandfather uh, often uh, talked about that. And I remember my father, who'd been all over the world, was a diplomat, did all this, had awful arguments with my grandfather about Jesus because my grandfather honestly thought, although he didn't say that, but in my, uh, my humble opinion, I believe he really believed Jesus never drank anything stronger than Welch's grape juice, which wasn't invented until 1920. If you squeeze a grape and pour it in a bottle, it will ferment. It becomes alcohol by nature. That's the way it works. But he didn't believe that people at Jesus' time nor Jesus ever drank any wine that was real wine. It was like well, just grape juice. So they had these huge arguments about whether Jesus did that. But I remember those things. And the only reason I'm telling you that is because what I love about what we're going to look at now for the next four weeks is how the church has taken the commandments, the Ten Commandments, which I was taught as a child, but I can check it off pretty well. You know, did you kill anybody today? No, I didn't kill anybody today. So, you know, did you steal anything today? No. So that was it. But the church has taken that and broken it down and developed a way that you can model your life after what Christ is causing us to do as it applies to the commandments. It gives you guidance for moral life. It tells you how certain things are not good for you or certain things are, are detrimental to your, your health, your spiritual growth, your faith, and how you can get out of this. And we'll look at those in a moment. I'm gonna share with you. I think I may have given them out before. Did I give you all these before? Okay, no, that's the belief. I'm sorry, that's not what I wanna give you. Did I give you these purple things? Um, examination of conscience? No, I don't 
Anyway, the ones that are in the pews up, that are outside the confession. So you know those purple sheets? Can I give you those? Is it on the prayer? Try, try. It's a trifold. It opens up. There's. Okay, well, I'll, I'll bring it. I'll bring it next week. But what that does is it takes the commandments and breaks them down into subordinate subsets of things. So the fifth commandment is thou shalt not kill. But you can kill somebody's reputation by lying about them. You can make up something or you can share something that you heard that no one else needs to know. You didn't need, need to know, but you don't need to share it. And you can share it and destroy them. Look at the kids with um, social media, how they destroy each other by putting out things that are either true or not true. They send it to all their friends. That's a violation of the fifth commandment. That is a perfect act of, of harming someone's character. So you can destroy a person's character in violation of the fifth commandment. You, can, you, you don't have to commit adultery to violate the ninth commandment. As Jesus even said, you can have serious thoughts about things. You don't have to steal something to, to commit, uh, you know, to, to violate the fifth commandment especially if you plan it, if you fantasize about how to rob a bank and go through all the details, that can lead you into that direction. So all the subordinate sets of this, of the commandments are what we will explore. And it's really, really helpful. And it gives you guidance. And why do we need that? Because when we get to the sacrament of penance, confession, when we go into the details of it, this will give you a great confidence in how you prepare to go to confession. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to look through a structured guide, say, did I do, have I done these things? Did I do those things? Did I do this last week? How did I, how did I, if I did that, why did I do that? What was the cause? And it really gives you guidance. So what we want to look at beginning tonight is how the church uses the commandments to give us a structure to live a moral life. Jesus gave us moral guidance. Morality is part of who we are. You have instinctive morality. That's called a conscience. And a conscience is a wonderful thing. I think I mentioned that. If, if this is a hot stove, I'm not going to be able to put my hands on it because my fingers know if it's really hot, I'll destroy my fingers. I won't touch a red hot stove because my, my sense of touch warns me. Conscience warns you of things that are detrimental to your spirit. And you get a warning. And it's called your conscience, like a voice. Don't do that. You don't really want to do that. Now, unlike touch, where you can't physically put your hand on a stove until it burns to the bone without great pain, your conscience can be dulled. You can do something once, have this terrible feeling, do it a second time, not feel quite as bad, do it third time, becomes kind of routine. And then you've lost your conscience. So there's ways to get around sinful aspects to our soul. But, but it's very similar to that idea of touch. So we want to look again, starting with the two greatest commandments. So it goes uh, back to the story of Jesus. And he starts out one of the stories where a lawyer. Now, who was a lawyer? It wasn't somebody that practiced law. It was somebody that knew the law of Moses backwards and forwards. So there's five books in the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, Numbers and Deuteronomy. They memorized those. Steps. There were people, there were lawyers who could, who could quote any paragraph and chapter. Remember at the time of Christ, there were no verses or chapters. They, they memorized the whole scroll. And these people knew the law by heart. And if you had a problem and you wanted to go and say, I have this situation with my neighbor, what does the law tell me I can do or not do? The lawyer often, uh, sometimes the Pharisees could, but primarily a lawyer, could give you guidance. And that's why there were lawyers. So this lawyer comes up to Jesus to test him. And he says to him, uh, what is the greatest commandment of the law? Meaning the 10 commandments and all that's reflected. And I meant to bring it, I'll have to bring it next week to show you. Um, some of these lawyers apparently went through the first five books of the Bible and everywhere in any one of those five books, it said, the Lord said, do this. Or the Lord said, don't do this. They wrote it down. And by the time of Christ, there were 613 rules and regulations that the Pharisees wanted everyone to live by. And some of them, they even made up. There were hedges around the law. 
and just make sure you don't violate the law, then don't even do this because you might violate the law or don't even do that because that might lead you to where you might violate the law. So these were the rules that they were trying to live under the time of Christ. And that's why Pharisees were trying to get everybody to live a good life so that God would send the Messiah to them, the, the king. And the glory cloud would come back and the Ark of the Covenant would come. So anyway, this lawyer comes up to Jesus to test him and he said, what is the greatest of the commandments? And Jesus replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He said, this is the greatest in the first. Well, surprise, surprise, that's right out of Deuteronomy. That's the Shimna, the great Jewish prayer. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, and mind. And then they added, the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus took those right out of the Old Testament. It's not unique to Matthew. Matthew's telling the story, but that's what Jesus replied. This is the greatest and the first commandment, and the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus added, on these two commandments, all the rest of the law depends. So if you can do those two things, then everything else will fall into place. And so often I grew up thinking everything Jesus said was unique and everything Jesus said was, you know, the Holy Spirit, and well, he was God. So he, whatever he said was the word of God and so on. Well, so much of what Jesus said came right out of the Old Testament because he was a Jew and he knew the law, but he knew it in a way that no, no lawyer knew it. He knew it in a practical way. And that's why this the Sermon on the Mount is such an interesting exposure of how to live a life that fulfills the law, but in a different way. So this is what we're looking at. The two great commandments, love God and then love your neighbor. And by the way, I, almost everywhere you hear that, those are, the, those are the two major issues. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. Well, guess what? John came along and he gave us another command. It's in, it's in the, last, uh, the uh, last Supper discourse. I think it's in Matthew 13 or 14, uh, John 13 or 14. Jesus said, I give you a new command. He said, you love your neighbor as I have loved. Boy, it's hard enough to love your neighbors you love yourself. It's hard enough to love yourself to start with. I mean, I'm my worst critic. I beat myself up all the time. So I'm, I'm not the best example of love when it comes to how I feel about myself, although I've gotten better over the years. But to love your neighbor as Christ loves you, that's Christ loving you on the cross. He gave his life for you. He died for you. No greater love has a man than to give his life for his friend. I told you about the young soldier that died for his friend in, in my command. That's the ultimate command. But let's stick with loving your neighbor as you love yourself and see how far, at least get as far as you can with that. And that's what we want to look at. So this is the great challenge of these two commandments. Now it's interesting because love and sacrifice, anybody that's been married for any length of time knows, love is sacrifice. You, you love the... Love is defined in some cases as doing the will of the other, doing the good of the other. One of the things we talk about in Conference for the Engaged when we gave it is love. I mentioned, may I mentioned, love's not a 50-50 process. I don't give 50% and you give 50%. Beverly doesn't cook dinner as long as I take the trash out. If I fail to take the trash out, then there's no dinner. I mean, that's 50-50. That's, that's give and take. No. At the wedding, you give yourself to the other person. And that's why you and your future spouse are the minister of the sacrament. Holy matrimony, the minister is the couple. You pledge yourself to each other. So that, that love of self-gift is 100%. Will the good of the other. And so it does require sacrifice. And particularly when children come along, it requires a lot of sacrifice. And so love and sacrifice are synonymous in that sense. God loves us and he's given us his law. And so many people see the commandments because of the way they're written in the Bible. And even though the King James was harder, even the newer model, modern translations make it sound awkward. Don't do this. I mean, it reminds me as a child, 
parents, don't, don't play with matches. Why not? They, they light up. So what do you want to do? You want to play with matches till you get burned. Usually you, you'll get burned. But there were so many things like, don't play in the street. Where are we going to play? All these rules that seem to be so negative, they seem to be restricting our, our freedom. I remember we went to a class, Beverly, I went to a class when we were older, with our kids were older, and it was called Parent Effective in the Street. And it was um, a class on how to be good parents. And they taught us some really useful things, but one of the things that this woman, there was a woman there that was a psychiatrist, and she talked about being consistent, whatever you are being consistent, and don't ever go back on something you've given on nonsense, it didn't work. But anyway, she, uh, she told us a story about her two children. She had a teenage daughter and a five-year-old. And she said, my five-year-old was able to, to open the car door. We didn't wear seatbelts in those days. So when the car would stop, he would open the door and jump out. He's five years old. So this drove her crazy because she knew she'd go to Giant, stop in the parking lot, open the door, and he'd jump out. So she got a restraint and she tied him to the steering wheel. Now, today she'd probably go to jail for the rest of her life for child abuse. But her attitude was, I'd rather he get mad at me for restraining him than he becomes a bumper sticker on somebody else's car. So he, she said, I loved him. So I restrained him till I could convince him not to jump out of the car. So he said, it was a loving thing that I did. But the biggest battle she had was her teenage daughter. Her teenage daughter wanted to single date at like 15. And the woman said, you know, I'm whatever she was then, I'm 35. I've been through all that. I've been through dating. I got married. I have children. I know what it's like. I know the dangers. I know how dangerous it is out there for my daughter. So I am going in love, restricting her. You can only date in groups until you're 18 or whatever. Well, the daughter hated her. I mean, all her friends were dating and all that. But she said, I loved her. So I restrained her. And those examples always stuck with me. Because the Ten Commandments are God's loving restraints. They're not denying you freedom. They're not meant to keep you from being who you want to be. God created us. He basically has given us the user manual, which we call the Bible, which most men never read the user manual. They always put the daggum thing together and leave parts out. So you don't read it. But if you read it, it's designed to help you live a happy life and achieve the purpose for which God created you, which is to be with him. So there are restrictions, but there should be seen as things that in love help you. I heard a theologian once say, or a professor once say, that the reason God gave the one commandment to Adam and Eve, and if you remember what it was, is don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the reason that he didn't want them to eat of that tree at that point was they were not emotionally, spiritually qualified to make those distinctions. And if they were in charge of making those distinctions, they could really destroy themselves. So out of love, he precluded them from putting themselves in a position that could cause them detriment. So don't eat of this one tree. Well, the devil tempted him you know, the rest of the story in original sin. But it was out of love that he was trying to restrain him. It's out of love he gave us the Ten Commandments. So these should not be seen as heavy duty baggage. Don't do something you want to do. But I think if, as I mentioned this before, I think if we were going to get together and decide to live in a community, and we were all going to live in a communal home, and we were all going to live together and share everything, we would come up with rules. And they wouldn't be far different than the Ten Commandments. So they're really rules of how people, how human beings live together. So God loves us. He gave his law to make us happy and to help us to get to heaven. And we know disobeying his laws, we call sin. And it's easy to do. And we said Jesus summed up this law, again, in loving your God with a heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, there's different kinds of 
of laws, physical law, law of nature, everybody knows if I let go of this, gravity will cause it to fall on the table. So that's a physical. There's natural law that human conscience directs. We know certain things are wrong. You would know instinctively. Well, I've got to tell you, having raised three children, and then, well, the foster babies were infants. They didn't get in as much trouble. But watching children, they can be pretty, pretty mean on the playground. They can, they're not angels. And especially boys, they could get in more trouble. But there is natural law. We do know instinctively that taking someone's life would be wrong. That stealing is wrong. We, we know it's, it's not right to take something from somebody else. But then you have divine positive law. And that's where we get the commandments. That's where the scripture gives us the guidance. That's where the mor moral life is made visible to us. So divine positive law is the sum total of the prescriptions, the admonitions that God has given us uh, through supernatural revelation. Now again, both sacred scripture and sacred tradition. So what we saw leading to the creed still is the source, it's the wellspring of God's divine positive law. And these rules, these laws govern uh, the, the way we act and they help us determine whether the act is going to be good or evil because God has made it very clear as the source of determining good and evil, uh, which are good, and which are evil. We're beginning to witness more than any time in my lifetime as we get further and further away from any divinity in our cultural life. This idea that whatever the majority thinks is morally okay is okay. When you start rejecting God's moral law and start man, living by man's determined, flexible, ever-changeable law, or worse, where we are today, is that I have no right to dictate any law to you, even if it came from God, because your opinion is equal to my opinion. So whatever you think is right's right, and whatever I think is right's right. How do we live in a society? We end up with this, this guy that drove the car through the people in the, at the parade. That's what we end up with. And this is what's happening when society breaks down and we lose these things. So divine positive law governs and helps us determine. And the Holy Father, St. John Paul II pointed out that there are certain acts that are intrinsically evil. There is no way to justify them as being good. Many other things can be different for different people. I, I know how certain things that are taught in our house for our children were different than things taught for children who were their peers in houses without faith. And they had different morality and they had different views. I remember my parents' morality. I remember being taught how my father expected me to act on a date and how he expected me to treat women and how what he thought was important and how important it had been to him and how he had learned it from his father. And it was a very important lesson. And it caused me to always want to never commit an act that I would disappoint my father. And it was a wonderful thing. It was a wonderful guide. But certain acts are by definition evil. Then you have, the, again, under the divine positive laws, moral law, it's a norm of human conduct as revealed, and we know it by reason, and it, it does bind our conscience. Now, for an act, which is what you do, you've got basically everything else but involuntary acts. Breathing, you have no control. To a certain extent, thought, you have not a lot of control. You can Thoughts can come into your mind from no. But when you act, when you take a, a, an inclination that is good from the will and you do it, then that's an act. And if an act is going to be moral, the object of the act, what, what you're acting on must be moral. The end that you're trying to achieve must be moral. And the circumstances surrounding the act must be moral. Now, what am I basically saying? You can never live by the rule 
the end justifies the means. And that's pretty much what society is saying today. If a good comes out of it, then we can, I mean, look at the looting and the, and the pillaging and the rioting, the things that went on the summer before last and all this craziness that's going on. And society just seems to think, well, that's just their right to burn off steam. I remember when we had the riots in Baltimore and the mayor came out and said, these people need to have a place to, to let go of their frustration. You can burn down a drugstore, loot it and then burn it to the ground. That's okay because you're frustrated? Really? And she pulled the police back when they went in, when they first started. Remember, they were just, I was watching on TV and suddenly there was, this riot was going on, they're burning the store down and, and the police came and then she ordered them back and they just pulled back and let them burn it up. And their excuse was, well, they're justifiably angry. It's okay, it's just property. That's where we go. But the end doesn't justify the means. So this is where we're living. Now, accentuating the positive, the Ten Commandments are our principal duties. The first three are to God, from us to God, toward Him, and the other four are from us to our the other four from us to our neighbor. One through three, four through ten. I'm sorry, three and. So again, all of these are aimed to make us happy. If you live a happy life, if you obey the law, if you live the virtues, remember, you looked at some of the virtues that are listed in here, and you looked at the seven deadly sins, which is the opposite of those virtues. <coughs> we can know what to do. We can seek that guidance. We can pray for inspiration, and that will give you a happy life. And I just throw this stuff in because I'm a Bible teacher. Uh, this is the flight of the Hebrew people after they came out of Egypt, after the plagues and finally the Passover. They went all the way down here and ended up on Mount Sinai. And it was at Mount Sinai <coughs> that God gave Moses, not just the stone tablets. Yes, the two stone tablets. Only place in the Bible something is written on the front and the back. Um, except for a scroll, I think, in Revelation. But he gave him the Ten Commandments, but he gave him all five books of the Bible right there. And again, somebody had their cell phone. We were able to take this marvelous picture of Mount Sinai. But the image there, you know, 500,000 men plus women and children, it's a lot of people at the bottom of this mount. Moses was up there 40 days and 40 nights. They thought right away, well, he's been up there. I mean, I, I can just envision this, this image. You've been, you've been 20 days and you ask your neighbor, what do you think happened to Moses? I don't know. Do you think he's going to come back? Well, she's been up there a long time. And you go all the way to 40 days and they finally say, no, he's dead. So we're going to end up doing something. So here he's up there. He's getting the Ten Commandments. That's what they'd be look like, look like if they were written in Hebrew. And what were they doing after 40 days? Well, they had an orgy. They said he's dead. Now, the interesting thing is, the golden calf was an Egyptian god. It was the most prolific e Egyptian god, and it was all about fertility, and it was all about uh, having lots of children and that sort of thing. And they worshipped these, these cows. They worshipped their, the bulls. They drank their blood. They bathed in their blood. All this was an Egyptian god, Apis. So the first thing they did after they thought Moses was dead is collect all the gold that they had taken from the Egyptians when they fled and put it together and gave it to Aaron and he came up with a golden calf and that's what they were worshiping. And that's what just caused God to be so upset. Well, anyway, comes down and 2,000 of them are, are killed and then he goes back and 40 days later, well, this is when he came down, Cecil B. DeMille's, I don't know the Bible story, but Cecil B. DeMille's played that role and threw the stone step. But anyway, he goes back and he gets the Ten Commandments. So that's where we are. So what is the command? It's a mandate, an edict, an order. Decalogue means 10, 10 words, 10 phrases, sum up 10 laws given by God to the people of Israel based on the covenant that came by Moses. Foundation of the duties of man toward God, first three, love God, other seven, love neighbor. So you see how the two commandments summarize it? 
love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Summarize the Ten Commandments. Now, there are, in this little handout you have, it gives you the seven works, spiritual works of mercy, and the seven, um, I don't think of a term. Seven, sorrowful, I'm sorry. Seven, I can't think of it. Corporal, seven corporal works of mercy and the seven spiritual works of mercy. So these are the seven spiritual works. We are, we are called, when you see someone sinning, to admonish them. Not get on a soapbox, not preach down to them, but remind them, tell them, this is going to harm you. This is a sin. You're to instruct people who don't know any better. You're to counsel people who have doubt. You're to comfort people who are, who are sorry. We should forgive all injuries to ourselves. We should bear wrongs to us patiently. And we should pray for the living and the dead. Those are things that we can do as works of mercy to, to grow in spiritual life. And the circle of prayer must encompass the whole world. We need to pray for the world itself, all people, primarily for different groups that are closer to you. And then, okay. So again, what, what importance does the church give to the Ten Commandments? Uh, infidelity to the teaching of the scriptures and the example of Christ, uh, we have to keep the Ten Commandments. It's possible to do that with the help of Christ. It's not easy. You just don't get up in one morning and say, I'm going to keep the Ten Commandments. But with prayer and help, you can grow with that and it'll help you to keep the gift of his spiritual. This is the two places they're found in the Bible. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 give that listing. I've got to show you something that will blow your mind in a minute. This is the way the Catholics see it. One, two, and three. I'm the Lord your God. You just have no strange gods before me. Two, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Three, remember to keep the holy the Lord's day. I have a question. Sure. On um, Commandment 5, yeah. uh, thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. What if you're like at your home and you're getting robbed by someone else and they're threatening to kill your family and you kill them in their yeah. defense? Well, it's an excellent question. And, the, and when we're going to get the fifth command, I'll go into it in more detail, but basically, as a human being, you have the right to self-defense. So if somebody is threatening me and will have the potential to kill me, I have the right to defend myself, even with lethal response. That extends to your family. Then we extend that to the community through the police force. And then we extend that to the nation through the military. So killing is not really just the idea you kill somebody, it's more murder. Murder is a better term here. Police kill people, military people kill people. In self-defense, you kill people. But you can't murder someone, choose to go out and take their life for no reason. We'll talk about that when I get to the fifth commandment, because it's an excellent question, especially for people in the military, because we all know where when you're involved in combat, you're responsible for the lives of people on the other side. And you worry about that. Am I am I being in violation of the command, but it, it, I'll show you how the logic flows to that. But thanks for that. That's an excellent question. Um, then honor your father and mother. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. And don't covet your neighbor's wife or goods. Now, I just put this up for you to look at later. It's just that different denominations took the commandments and put them in a different order. Um, and it's a long story. The Catholic version is the one I just gave you, the Protestants. And, and it's really funny because someone had a license plate that said, uh, do not violate the sixth commandment. Well, the sixth commandment for you is to commit adultery. And for someone else, it was to kill. Or I think it was the other way around. It was, a, it was the fifth command. Don't violate the fifth commandment. You shall not kill. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. So this bumper sticker said, do not violate the fifth commandment. So the Protestants all thought, why would somebody say that? And the Catholics all understood he was talking about murder. <laughs> you know, it's just, but anyway, they, they line up a little bit different. That's all I wanted to share there. Okay, so then we want to look quickly at 
the background of these commandments real quick. I'm the Lord your God, you shall have no strange gods before me. We're, honor, we're called to honor and give glory to God. That's why we worship. It's an act of faith to go to mass and worship. That's where we adore Christ. That's where we pray to God the Father. That's where we offer glory and honor. We make an act of faith by expressing our belief in God. Father gave a great talk last week about faith. And again, faith is a gift. And, and you commit to something you can't see or know for sure, as in science. But, but it is, it's still revealed by God and it's true. So we do need to look at that as we examine our conscience each day. Two things that can be a sin against the first commandment. Apostasy is somebody who believes in the faith and then they walk away from it. And a lot of people do that. And I'm not saying that, that just because a kid goes off to college and doesn't go to mass, he's in, apost he's in apostasy, but it can get to that. You can give up on your faith. You can walk away from your faith. You can just say, I don't believe it. I'm gonna be secular now. And the other thing is heresy is teaching something that's not part of the faith, something that's not true or that you've made up. You wanna hope and love and have a childlike belief. <coughs> just like a child believes in their parents, we believe in hope of God's love. <coughs> presumption is a sin. And here's the example of presumption. It's Monday. If I commit a sin today, no sweat, I'll go to confession on Saturday. And since I'm going to confession on Saturday, then that leaves me free to commit the same sin Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because I'm going to, I'm going to go to confession on Saturday. You're presuming you'll be alive on Saturday. You're presuming there will be a confession on Saturday. Presuming the church will still be. It's presumptions. You don't know you're going to be here on Saturday. You can't do a sin thinking you'll be forgiven on Saturday. That's presumption. So don't do that. The other is despair. Despair is the, really, despair is the unforgivable sin. Sin against the Holy Spirit. The idea that you don't believe God can forgive you. There's nothing you can commit that God can't forgive, except despair. Well, you said, I don't believe God can forgive me. How can God forgive you if you don't believe he can forgive you? So that's the other sin against that. It's a sin against hope. A sacrilege, superstition, these are things that can cause a problem with this. We can lose faith. We must avoid bad company and temptation. Uh, we need a well-formed conscience. People say, I, all I have to do is live by my conscience. True, but you can't deny forming your conscience. You have to learn what it is that's true. You must not commit sacrilege against sacred persons, places, or things. Avoid being superstitious. God's going to take care of you. Walking under a ladder is not going to cause the world to come to an end. See a black cat run across your path doesn't mean your whole world's going to go upside down. Reading a horoscope, for Pete's sake, you really think that's going to affect your day? But there are people that live by this stuff. Again, you can play, pray to the Blessed Mother and sa the, the uh, saints. We're called to love God. That means we need to be charitable, avoid scandal, avoid hatred and envy and sloth. Sloth is not just laziness. It, it's sloth in anything, in your work and in, in whatever you do, you can be spiritually lazy. Um, again, the definition I mentioned is the will, the good of the other. So, that is the uh, overview of the first two commandments. Next week, we will look at the second and third commandment, fourth and fifth commandment. So chapter 17 and 18. And that's when we'll get into more detail about killing and that sort of thing and give you a little bit more example of that. And then we'll meet, uh, like I said, there's four weeks of this. Uh, after next week, we'll take the two weeks off and then in January, we'll come back and do the sixth and ninth commandment, and the seventh and tenth commandment. And then we will start, uh, after that, the eighth and the commandments of the church. Finally, we will get into the sacraments um, in late January. And we'll spend a lot of time on each of the seven sacraments. <coughs> Any questions or comments or anything? A lot of talking tonight. Don't ever forget, don't smoke cigarettes. Oh, send your oh. Whatever you do. <coughs> My grandfather, I, I, part of that story, my fraternity brother, when I was a, a, a sophomore, came 
to have dinner at my grandparents' house. They had this farmhouse. They were retired. We had a wonderful meal. Everything was from their yard. Chicken was from their yard. Milk was from their cow. Grows great. The, the vegetables all came out of their garden. Wonderful, wonderful meal. And my fraternity brother was very nice. Wanted to make a good impression on my grandfather and mother. And so they were sitting at the table. And at the end of dinner, they had this wonderful dinner, apple pie, everything. He, he reached in his pocket, took out, and lit up a cigarette. I'll never forget. My grandfather looked down at him and said, young man, would you please take the tool of the devil out of my house? I think if he could have eaten that cigarette, he would have. He was so embarrassed. It just, it shocked me. I've never heard him, I've heard him preach on it, but I never thought about it. That's how he, he felt that what, that was the tool of the devil in his house. So he spent his entire career, his entire life as a pastor preaching the gospel against cigarettes to tobacco farmers. And I don't know how he did it, but he did. And he would go help them. He would help them with their crops. He'd help them with it, put it in the barns. And he was a wonderful, but how they supported him with their little meager donations, I don't know. But he preached against cigarettes and that was their main crop. That's what they raised it for. He's a great guy though, I love him. He was wonderful. All right, in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If I start telling a story again, you can hold up your fingers and then I'll stop. Everybody in our family does that. They, all know. they always know. God bless you. Thanks so much for coming. I'll see you uh, next Monday.